Hello, everybody. This is the first time I've done a uh, formal lecture um, online like this, but hopefully it won't be too impersonal. Um, I'm very happy to be able to, to address uh, all of you today. The Maritime History and Marine and Underwater Archaeology Facebook group. I don't know exactly who this is going to go out to, but I assume a lot of people uh, in India and elsewhere around the world. And you'll be seeing this, of course, um, recorded at some future date, I guess on July 12th. So um, I'm gonna talk today about, obviously the title here, it's about our excavations at Berenike on the Red Sea coast of Egypt. Uh, the project started in 1994. And for those of you unfamiliar with the site, if you take a look at this map, uh, it shows you, of course, um, those portions of the, uh, of the old world, as we call it, across the pond, uh, and the various major trade routes uh, linking these vast areas of Europe, Africa, and Asia together. So obviously today we're going to concentrate only on uh, the site of Berenike, although of course it was only one of many uh, points along this vast uh, network that uh, joined, as I said, three continents together, basically uh, linking the uh, northwestern Indian Ocean via the Red Sea uh, to uh, the Mediterranean. So you see the location there, it's circled. And of course, uh, since mainly we're dealing with the maritime aspect of this trade, uh, the ancients would, of course, had to be very familiar with the monsoon wind patterns in the Indian Ocean, which you see down there on the bottom right, and the wind patterns uh, in the Red Sea, which you see on the left. So these uh, dictated sailing times to and from uh, Berenike, and obviously it points further south in the Red Sea, and then uh, across uh, Southern Arabia to the Indian subcontinent and south along, of course, the Indian Ocean coast of Africa. So here's a little, uh, uh, more close-up view of the site. Uh, the the uh, satellite image in the bottom left uh, very clearly identifies the Sinai Peninsula at the north there, and the little arrow points to the location of Berenike. Uh, and again, if you look at the bottom right, you can see a, a more regional map of Berenike and a number of the sites uh, associated with it that unfortunately we're really not going to have time to talk about uh, today extensively. This shows you uh, a, a view of the site uh, in the trench, trenches that we have excavated since 1994. We have not been able to excavate continuously every season since 1994. There have been periods uh, when we did not receive permits and were unable to excavate. It, it, it looks fairly impressive, but it, gives, uh, it projects really a false sense because um, very few of these trenches have actually reached bedrock or virgin soil. And uh, we've really only probably excavated at most maybe 2% of this massively huge site. Uh, one of the things that's assisted us in locating trenches um, with a great deal of success is uh, magnetic mapping or geomagnetic mapping. And this basically is very simple. It's uh, taking an X-ray of what's beneath the soil for a distance, a depth of about anywhere from 50 centimeters to a meter, sometimes a little bit more. And you can see very clearly uh, on the right, to the right of the red box, uh, uh, it gives a very good idea of the outline uh, of the major part of the city from Roman times anyway. Uh, to give you an idea of the size of the site, the red box there, as you see, uh, is uh, 10,000 square meters. So it will be many uh, generations before this site is, is completely excavated, if ever. It was founded around 275 BC uh, by the Ptolemaic monarch uh, Ptolemy II Philadelphus. And for those of you who aren't familiar with uh, Western, that is Mediterranean history, the Ptolemies were a dynasty established in Egypt uh, after the death of Alexander the Great. Ptolemy I was in fact one of uh, Alexander the Great's generals. So anyway, Ptolemy II founded a number of ports uh, along the Egyptian Red Sea coast and further south along the Red Sea coast of Africa. And we know a fair amount about uh, this period, uh, although not as much as we'd like. If you see our magnetic map, you can see an outline there of uh, the Hellenistic, that is the Ptolemaic period fortifications and some of the other buildings that we have 
uh, excavated. And I'll just show you a few uh, pictures of this. If you take a look at the top left, that's the foundation of part of the city wall uh, from this period. And in the top right here, if you can see my cursor, uh, this is another section of the wall. This is the remains of a very badly robbed out tower along the wall. And then this area here, which you see here is the same as up here. It's part of the wall, city wall later on, uh, excavated down by us to reach this uh, very interesting uh, well that produces uh, something on the order of two to 3,000 liters of water um, uh, in the course uh, of, uh, of a day. And you can see here the well. Uh, and of course, it also doubled as a cistern. We have a tunnel in the back here that leads off to an area uh, that we're not sure of because uh, as you can see, it's clogged with sand and we have not had the opportunity to excavate that. But we do have ample evidence for its date. It was certainly used in the early period after the foundation of the port. Uh, all of the pottery dates to this period. You see a number of amphoras. Uh, here's one, the one with the red arrow indicates uh, this name, this depinta, which says Antiochu in Greek, which means of Antiochus. We're not sure who that individual was. And then as we've excavated further in the area, we've come up with this, uh, here's the well, this massive hydraulic complex, uh, which uh, might be uh, in part a bath from this period and partly a water catchment system. Uh, it seems to have been a little wetter uh, in the third century BC, and there's indications that some of the rainwater uh, was uh, also siphoned into cisterns uh, adjacent to the well. We've certainly found evidence uh, of what the Ptolemies were most interested in, that was the acquisition of war elephants. Of course, they did not have access um, uh, to the Indian variety. Uh, so, of course, they sought those uh, in East Africa, mainly the bush and the forest elephants. And we found the remains of what we're pretty sure is an elephant retaining pin here, where they would have unloaded the elephants and kept them here prior to marching them across the desert to the Nile. The scale circled in red is a 50 centimeter. And we've also found actually um, osteological evidence of the presence of the elephants. This is part of a skull of a juvenile elephant, and we see some molars here, parts of teeth. Uh, the DNA is too degraded to identify the species, unfortunately. And here's some other evidence uh, from the, this period, uh, stamped amphora handles, um, uh, another broken amphora. This uh, horse-headed horse was a Egyptian sun god crocodile, and this cartouche, uh, which in fact dates from the 10th century BC, must have been someone's heirloom. Now let's take a look at, again, the magnetic map, and we're gonna start out here uh, taking a look at some early Roman burials circled in red here. These burials uh, were interred after the uh, well had fallen out of use, um, and so it wasn't a regular cemetery, it was sort of a makeshift, uh, which you can tell by the orientation of the burials. They were basically put in the ground uh, as a soft ground presented itself, and the arrows here, here, uh, represent some of these burials, which you see close close up here. The amphoras here, which you see here, are part of a hydraulic system, and you see a close up of those here. Now, these Roman burials are from the early Roman period, which is uh, basically the first century AD. Um, many of them have no grave goods. Some of them have some. Uh, here's a, a headless man wearing an iron ring from this area near the cistern. And this is an older man who was carried, covered in a burial shroud. His iron ring is here. And then a number of beads, interestingly, imported from the subcontinent. And then here's a burial of a, of a tall woman whose head is covered, as you can see, with the remains of an amphora. And then, uh, like I said, I could show you lots of burials. Uh, you get the idea. The, these are some more that we've recently found in the, in the past two or three years. Uh, here is an individual. Uh, often the bodies are too decayed to even identify gender. We can usually establish age. Uh, this actually had the remains of the wooden uh, coffin made of teak wood uh, imported from India. Here's some of the burial goods at the foot of this individual. Here you see them here. And here's another view after we cleared off the burial shroud of this individual. So these uh, burial goods here would have been found down in this area. And then we have this very interesting burial. See a cross burial. So clearly there was an earlier burial and then later on someone unknowingly dug into this 
and buried a second individual, as you can see, across at perpendicular angles to the uh, uh, previous individual. Uh, and we have, of course, a number of burials, other burials in the city, as well as hundreds of them uh, outside the city. Again, we don't want to spend a lot of time on this. Um, but the formal cemeteries tended to be, as was common in, in Roman times uh, and in Hellenistic and Greek period, uh, they tended to be on, on roads leaving uh, urban centers. And so you see the red arrow here. Uh, this is towards the northwest of the city this uh, partial cemetery we excavated in 2001, and it included this little cyst burial of a two-year-old girl who was covered uh, with a pot shirt. She'd had a burial shroud, and she also had some beads uh, buried with her. Um, now, uh, we've also, of course, one of the, one of the most uh, exciting places to excavate is a trash dump, at least in Egypt, because the preservation is so good due to the dry climate. And we've had uh, a lot of interesting finds from our early Roman, that is first century AD trash dump, including the discovery of an animal cemetery. Now animal cemeteries are not unusual in ancient Egypt, but as you'll see, ours is, uh, is a little more unique than, than the run of the mill uh, animal cemetery. So the trash dumps are excellent places to find written documents such as papyri. And here you have a selection of these, a bill of sale for a donkey, uh, a letter from a mother named Hikane to her son. In fact, she's complaining about the fact that her son hasn't written to her recently. So this is a, <laughs> this could have been written any time in history. And then we have a, a poetic papyrus here dedicated to uh, the goddess Sibylle. Uh, these kinds of documents also include broken pot churds with writing on them, which in the West we call ostraca. And uh, these are found usually fairly shallow. You don't have to excavate down too far. And we found hundreds and hundreds of these. This is a basket lid uh, containing a number of ostraca that have been thrown out. This gives you an idea of what they look like when they come out of the ground. And here they are cleaned up. This particular set has to deal with the Roman army's control of the acquisition, transport, and distribution of fresh water in the city. And to give you some idea, of course, oftentimes the ostrich are and, and not very legible, you see on the left. And we've uh, discovered that infrared photographies can sometimes, not always, produce uh, a much improved image. So you can see this is the same potsherd, uh, but on the right we've used infrared photography. And as you can see, there's a lot more legibility there uh, than, uh, the, than the example on the left. Um, so uh, the trash dump also has turned up, this early Roman trash dump has turned up in addition to all kinds of documents and other interesting finds. Uh, the remains of some earlier human burials. This is a remains of a 25 year old man. And then we've turned up well over 400 animals buried here. Most of them seem to be family pets. Uh, you'll see why we know that in just a second. The vast majority are cats and kittens. But we also have dogs, baboons, uh, birds, monkeys. Uh, and interestingly, several of the monkeys uh, come from North and South India. And one of the cats actually either comes from Northern India uh, or from Central Asia. We know that from, uh, from uh, DNA analysis. Anyway, this dog, as you can see here, was clearly someone's pet. Uh, he was carefully covered with a mat and then covered with broken pieces of amphoras. Uh, our osteologist, our bone specialist, was able to determine that he died from osteosarcoma, that's a bone cancer, at, at about the age of four. And we have an idea of what he might have looked like in life. This is uh, the same breed, maybe not the same coloring. And then here's some other examples. And again, how do we know they're pets? Well, again, the, the kinds of burials are given. Many of them, of course, are wearing collars made of iron or beads or a combination of those. So you can see uh, this cat with an iron collar. Here's the remains of another collar. Here's a kitten with a bead collar, remains of a baboon. And then again, you can see uh, 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 these cats, this one wearing a bronze collar, which you see here. And another one we just excavated uh, this past February, uh, wearing a bronze plaque. And we hadn't cleaned it up. Uh, so we don't know if it's like a name tag or owner's name or what might be on that. And then uh, some of the other monkeys, in addition to the rare uh, examples from the subcontinent, uh, we also have uh, uh, monkeys that are traditionally found closer to Egypt, such as these uh, griffet monkeys. Again, we know they're pets, 
uh, because they're wearing iron collars. And you see an example of what a grivet monkey looks like there. And then the bottom right gives you the range of the grivet monkeys, at least uh, today. Uh, lots of beads, and we found thousands of these. And if any of you have been excavating at R.A. Kamidu or Patanam are well aware of, of the vast number of beads that turn up there. Uh, the, we don't find uh, them as in large numbers at Veronica, but very interestingly, we find large numbers of beads from the subcontinent uh, and also from Sri Lanka, especially in the late period. That's the fourth, fifth, sixth centuries. So I'll just give you a brief sampling of some of the beads here. So many of these, of course, are Mediterranean made or Egyptian made, made elsewhere in the Near East, or as I've indicated to you, uh, from the subcontinent. So here you see some of the various Indo-Pacific beads. I think many of you will be familiar with these. Uh, very interesting lay this bead from Jatim um, uh, on Eastern Java in Indonesia is the uh, one artifact we have that uh, comes from uh, further east uh, than the subcontinent. Uh, the preservation, as I said, is excellent. So we actually have some of the original strings uh, on which the beads uh, were put. And that's what you see here. And then lots of glass. And of course, many of you are familiar with the Periplus of the Erythrian Sea. And it, it discusses um, the export of glass to Southern Arabia and to India. So I'll give you a, a quick run through sampling of the glass that we have found, we found lots of this uh, dating especially from the first to the fourth and fifth centuries AD. Some of it's painted, as you see there, the fish scene. Uh, I think many of you will recognize uh, the top right slide. These pillar bowls, glass pillar bowls are ubiquitous from about 50 BC to 50 AD. And they're found not only all over the Mediterranean world, but exported, of course, to Arabia, the Persian Gulf, the subcontinent, and into Central Asia. And here's some more. So we have excellent examples of, of glass, very high quality in many cases, uh, that was not only probably destined for export, but broken before it could be shipped, uh, but would have been used, of course, by some of the residence uh, in Berenike uh, itself. And here are some more from the later period. So there's uh, good examples of mosaic glass and painted glass. If you look very carefully, I think you will see the head of a duck or a goose here and then his feet here. So we have some really great examples uh, of glass. Of course, the uh, excellent uh, state of preservation due, the, due to the arid climate means that we have a lot of organic remains that you would not find uh, in the subcontinent. Lots of uh, basketry, matting, rope of various kinds. Uh, and you see some uh, very few examples here. We have quite a bit of this, remains of a broom or a brush, some, some woven straps. Here's some of the string. That's a fishing net on the bottom right. That's a net weight. They often would just take ropes or strings, time around rocks, and of course, then that would pull the nets down to the bottom, uh, and then they could uh, catch whatever uh, bottom-dwelling uh, marine life they wanted. And then just an array of other things. There was manufacturing on the site. This is the remains of turtle shell, uh, the lead seal, probably sealed a box of some kind. These leather girths might have used, been used uh, for sails, as you'll see later on, tent girths animal girths, uh, all kinds of possibilities there. Uh, lots of jar stoppers. No one really thinks of modern bottle caps as being of any use, but they're, they're ancient equivalent, uh, made in all kinds of materials, especially plaster, uh, wood, clay, and so on, are often decorated and sized or impressed with uh, information that tells us something about uh, the contents of the jar, who manufactured it, or where it was made. So important sources of information uh, coming from an unlikely uh, medium. Coins, of course, uh, interestingly, we don't have that many in all of the seasons. We've got maybe uh, between eight and 900, which isn't really that many from a site like this. Uh, they're, for the most part, Ptolemaic issues uh, by that dynasty that I mentioned, uh, uh, ruling Egypt uh, from after, oh, a decade or two after the death of Alexander the Great to about 30 BC when the Romans took over Egypt. And, and the vast majority of the coins we get are Roman. And there's an example of one of them down there of the Roman Emperor Caligula. Uh, we, we have a fair amount of imported pottery, of course, at Berenike. Imported fineware, though, not too much. Here's some examples of items coming from the Mediterranean, a lamp handle, 
some stamped terra sigillata here, some more here. We used to believe this little auxiliary soldier was Roman, but most recently we think, uh, in fact, it might have been made in India at Ter up in the north, which had a big terracotta industry. So we're working on this. And if any of you have a, an opinion, we would, of course, uh, welcome feedback. Uh, by far and away, the most important of the, of the um, ceramic materials are the amphoras. They probably make up 95% of all of the pottery we find, and we find literally every season metric tons of this. What makes these jars so important, of course, they were the ubiquitous Mediterranean um, storage and shipment amphoras for grain and wine and oil, uh, things like that, fruit occasionally, fish sauce, items like that. Uh, and of course, they have very distinctive shapes and sizes and fabrics. And studying those uh, allows us to determine where these were made and when. And of course, that then allows us to create uh, a network uh, that fed these materials into Berenike and then onward for export uh, outside of the Roman world. And I think many of you are familiar, of course, with the large numbers of amphoras uh, that have turned up in India, especially at Patanam and at Ari Kamidu and elsewhere. Um, we do have uh, the occasional, what we would call exotic pottery. Um, we have the Nabataeans, uh, we can't really get into that. They were a trade empire in, in what is Jordan today for the most part. There's an example of a fine where Nabataean shirt that we found at the site. And we have a little bit of material from the Persian Gulf, but not much. And of course the Periplus of the Erythrian Sea tells us that there wasn't, at least at the time of the Periplus in about the mid first century AD, tells us that there really wasn't a lot of direct contact uh, between the Persian Gulf and the Red Sea. The, each of these areas was involved in a separate set of trade routes, apparently. Uh, a major import uh, from Southern Arabia, the Horn of Africa was of course frankincense. Uh, if you take a look at the map on the top right there, you can see the major frankincense uh, growing areas in what is uh, Southern Arabia today, basically Yemen, parts of Oman, uh, the Horn of Africa and the island of Socotra, basically frankincense. Uh, the genus is Boswellia. There are numerous species of frankincense within the genus. It's basically a tree and the tree is bled for its gum resins, which you see there, uh, which then solidify and are sold and still used today, uh, of course, for uh, burning for, uh, for the fragrance. And you can see there, this is a picture I took uh, in 2007 or eight, I can't remember which, um, in the souk in the Arab market in Yemen, in Sana'a, and it shows frankincense for sale there. And this is how it's burned, and this is what it looks like in the archeological record. Here's some of the other uh, aromatics that we find at the site, and here's a piece of frankincense wood uh, that we found at Berenike. I'm not sure why it's carved like that. Uh, other evidence of contacts with Southern Arabia include a number of graffiti uh, carved, as you can see, on jars. Uh, these are all in Hadramati, which is a pre-Islamic South Arabian language. Uh, and you can see some of the writings there. And then, of course, lots of material from India. Uh, the subcontinent in general, not just India. Um, early in our excavations, we uh, discovered this Tamil Brahmi graffito on the left, which has been well published, and many of you may already know about that. We get, of course, the famous rouletted ware, uh, which is found all over the subcontinent, and, uh, and uh, obviously at our site, and as, as far east as we know, and as you know, Southeast Asia, Indonesia, Sri Lanka, and so on. So these are early. Uh, the swastika we found in a 5th century AD trash dump, and as all of you know, uh, it's, it's a good luck symbol in the subcontinent, and it, it first came into the Mediterranean world probably in about the 10th century BC, serving uh, the same function among the Greeks and the Romans uh, as it did and still does. Uh, in the subcontinent. Uh, in addition to some of the fine wares, like the roulette that you saw in the previous image, we get a lot of coarse wares, cooking wares, lamps, things like this, that of course suggest that Indians, people from the subcontinent, were actually residing at Berenike. And we're fairly certain about this, as you'll see as we go along in the talk. You'll see the very uh, famous paddle impressed ware there. Um, some of, many of you will recognize uh, these kinds of lamps. Here's another fragment here. Uh, we found a number of these uh, at R.A. Kamidu. Uh, so, of course, did Sir Mortimer Wheeler 
and uh, and and uh, some of the French excavators as well. You just need to go look at the little museum in Pondicherry to see these. So uh, we find a, a not not a lot of this, but a steady stream of it, uh, not only from the early Roman period, but also from the later uh, as well. And of course, we know one of the major imports. Uh, this again from the Periplus, but we have lots of archaeological evidence were peppercorns, black peppercorns from uh, the Malabar coast, from the Western Ghat Mountains in, in what is Kerala today. And we found thousands and thousands of these. And then in, in 1999, uh, excavating just near one of the temples at Veronica, we found two jars you see here. And interestingly, the jar without the lid, which you see here, both the jars, by the way, were Indian made. We found over seven and a half kilograms of black peppercorns making this the largest single cache of black peppercorns found anywhere in the ancient Mediterranean world. So that was uh, quite a nice find. We have a lot of other material from the subcontinent, uh, coconut husks. Uh, these did not just come in as, as floatsam or jetsam uh, with the tides. They're found in all levels uh, from early to late, total, uh, sorry, early to late Roman. Of course, we can't know for sure that it came from India, but as you know, coconut is a, is a commodity found throughout the Indian Ocean Basin. We also found a number of these abris precatorius seeds. Many of you uh, will recognize these. Uh, 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 often referred to as gundu, I think I'm pronouncing that properly, rather than jindu, gundu mani plant. Uh, they have a very uniform weight of about three and a half grams, so they're typically used, at least they used to be, uh, in many jewelry shops in southern India uh, as gold weights because they're fairly uniform, as I said, with a weight of, of three, uh, three and a half grams. Um, uh, we have a number of textiles, lots of textiles from the site. And while many of them, of course, are Egyptian made or Mediterranean made, we have a lot of Indian made ones as well. This is one of the more interesting ones. As you can see, it doesn't look like much. It comes from a, a fifth century AD trash dump at Berenike. And as you can see, it's a resist dyed textile. You can see the rosette pattern here. And very interestingly, there's a very, very close parallel for it here in Ajanta Cave. Uh, number 17, also from the 5th century AD. Um, so um, clearly uh, they were manufacturing uh, this type of textile with this type of decoration uh, in India at this time. I've also seen examples actually in China along the Silk Road. So it seems that the Indians were mass producing uh, this material and exporting it not only to the West, to the Mediterranean world, but obviously North into China. And my guess is uh, if you had good preservation, you might find some of these in, in Southeast Asia uh, as well. Lots of various kinds of beads and gemstones. If you look at the beads on the top left, these are from the subcontinent. You have banded agate, you have quartz, um, you have carnelian, and not really quite sure what that might be. Um, and then we have, again, a sapphire, uh, probably from Sri Lanka. We have a number of these uh, Cameo blanks, which you've ex if you've excavated at our Ekamidu or Patanam or elsewhere uh, in India, you will recognize these. So these would probably have come from the northwest part of India, from the Barigaza area, and would have eventually been shipped west uh, for workshops, probably in Alexandria, in Egypt, or elsewhere in the Mediterranean, uh, where they would have been made into cameos. Uh, we do have some Indian coins uh, at the site, but again, not too many. This is one we found actually inside one of our temples that you'll be looking at later. You can see it's a Satahavana coin uh, dated to the early mid second century AD. You can see the Ujjain symbol uh, on the reverse and the elephant on the obverse. This is of course the region of the Satahavanas. I'm sure you're familiar with that. And then uh, the other Indian coin we found uh, dates from the fourth century. You see the silver one here from this part of India. And the only other non-Mediterranean coin that we've identified of the eight to 900 is this one from the kingdom of Aksum, a very important um, state polity uh, in the area of basically what is Ethiopia today and the surrounding areas. Uh, this became a very important uh, political and economic power, especially starting in the late third, early fourth century AD, when they too became active uh, in this uh, 
um, in this trade in the Red Sea and in the Indian Ocean. Here's some examples of some of the Aksumite pottery that we found. Again, not in the volumes that we've been finding the Indian material, uh, but of course, uh, the more we excavate, the more uh, this could change. Again, some, some of the textiles, many of them are very utilitarian, not very exciting at all, uh, but they come in different fabrics, wool and cotton, linen and so on. Now, um, what we've been concentrating most of our attention on in the past few seasons has been the Isis temple, which you see located with the arrow. Uh, when Berenike was first rediscovered in 1818 by uh, Giovanni Belzoni, uh, he concentrated some of his digging here, and a number of people who followed up after him, British, uh, Americans, or, uh, and some others, also tended to concentrate on this building, which is at the highest point of the site. Um, so for many years, we decided it wasn't worth excavating in here because these earlier 19th and early 20th century um, visitors had already done that. But uh, we changed our mind. Uh, and starting in 2015, we said, well, maybe some of these earlier visitors didn't really find everything. And we were very glad that we did change our mind. A Dutch colleague of mine, Martin Hentz, was the one who suggested we, we might want to take a second look, and he was absolutely right. Again, our magnetic map is showing the location of the Isis temple. The big white areas are giant trench we dug earlier, which we could not run our geomagnetic survey across. So when you see these white areas, uh, those are usually indicate areas of deep trenches uh, where we could not uh, conduct the magnetic survey, which obviously was done after we excavated some of these trenches. So here's what we call an orthophoto. Um, uh, it's basically a composite of many photographs showing you uh, the Isis temple, more or less an aerial view, as it appeared at the end of our uh, last excavation season this past February, 2020. So this is the east, this is the courtyard entrance here. Uh, then you get the courtyard itself, and then you get the interior of the temple. So there's three major areas here, and a number of rooms off to the sides, which you'll see are of some importance. So here's an artist's reconstructed view of what we know now. Of course, this could change with uh, future excavations. And uh, we know, in fact, uh, from 2015 on, uh, that there may well have been a much earlier roadstead or small port here from the 18th century BC when we know the Egyptian pharaohs were trading between this side here and Punt, which we think is down here. They were also interested in the frankincense and myrrh and other exotic commodities. And we have uh, several accounts of these voyages. And we think that Berenike may have been an intermediate stop for the crews, of course, to rest. And that's when they would have put together, uh, well, you've got eight fragments here uh, of this stele, this uh, stone slab indicating the name of the same pharaoh who appears in documents from the port up here at Mirsagawa Sis indicated in green. It was broken up at some point and tossed around the temple. As you can see, we found these pieces in different areas of the temple. We've also found some other earlier material predating the third century BC. This is a crown, uh, the red and white crown of an Egyptian pharaoh. Uh, you can see the possible dates there. We're not completely sure about the date, but somewhere between the 13th and the 7th centuries BC. And then some of the Ptolemaic items from the temple, although we haven't found the Ptolemaic temple itself, uh, is probably underneath the Roman one, the Roman period one that I'll be talking about. But certainly there must have been a Ptolemaic one here. Uh, remains of an inscription found by earlier visitors. We found a fragment recently that fits to that, and then clearly a Ptolemaic era stela in pharaonic style. Throughout the Ptolemaic and Roman periods in Egypt, much of the artwork resembles, of course, the earlier uh, Egyptian pharaonic uh, styles. So here again, a view of our orthophoto in the area in red uh, is the entrance to the temple, which you see here in two views. And very interestingly, just this past season, uh, we discovered this giant monumental inscription uh, in fragments in Greek, indicating the individual who uh, dedicated uh, the, the reconstruction of this temple, very wealthy businessman, as it turns out, to the goddess Isis, who was a god of, goddess of the sea. So you can see the importance uh, she would have 
for people at Berenike, mariners and merchants, and it's dedicated during the reign of the Emperor Tiberius. And I think many of you are aware that uh, a number of the Roman coins, of course, found in India do date uh, to the reign of this emperor. So here's some more fragments of this inscription. You can see this one here is what you see down here, but the bottom is you see has been decorated with a sun disc and some cobras, very typical decoration for, uh, for the Egyptians. Here's some more fragments. And then uh, our architect put together this melange, if you will, uh, of the inscription such as we have it so far. So as you can see, um, it's well over two meters across. So it's a massive inscription, uh, is in such good preservation that some of the red paint used to depict or highlight the letters still survive when we first dug it up. And I think if you look closely here, you can still see some of the red and yellow paint there as well. So that was a very exciting find. And we know the facade of the temple was decorated not only with this uh, magnificent uh, inscription that you saw dating from Tiberius, but later on in the second century uh, AD, um, uh, there was a redecoration, not quite as high quality in Egyptian style. And we know that this was dated to the reign of the Emperor Trajan, his dates you see down there. And how do we know that? Well, there's a cartouche. A cartouche is a little oval shaped thing, typical uh, in Egypt that it contains the name of the ruler. And uh, we know that this uh, belongs to the Roman Emperor uh, Trajan. Uh, here's some of the other decoration from the facade of the temple, so as you would enter into uh, the temple. And then you come to the courtyard area, which had large numbers of dedications, uh, including statuary and inscriptions, the one Indian coin we found here. If you take a look at these square bases, they're all inscriptions from the Roman period, but written in Greek, which was the lingua franca of the Eastern Roman Empire. Uh, these date from uh, the first century AD up into the middle of the third. So this, the temple that we, as we see it now, is from the Roman period. As I said, we have plenty of evidence to suggest an earlier Ptolemaic one here, um, but we have not yet found it. It must be immediately beneath uh, the Roman one. Here is one of the rooms off to the side, to the north, uh, which we had to sandbag up because it was collapsing. And then uh, here's another view here. So the area that you see in red here is what you see in detail here. And again, all of these square blocks contain inscriptions. So basically inscriptions for the most part come from the courtyard uh, area, uh, which is what you see in blue here. And the interior of the temple is what you see in red here and blue here. I sort of mixed up uh, the coloring here. So again, look at the ortho photo. The area in red is the courtyard area, which contains uh, most of the inscriptions I've talked about. And the blue is the actual temple interior. So here's just some overall views uh, of the temple, uh, not taken most recently. It's clearly had several stories to it. You can see a staircase, which would have come up to a roofed area. Uh, here you see another view of it. There's a little annex uh, on the outside of the temple to the north that we'll be looking at um, in a few minutes. Very important finds from here in 2019. And then let's just take a look. We can't spend uh, all of our time here. This is a room we just excavated in January and February this year, quite deep. In fact, we could not get to the bottom. It was too dangerous. Uh, but you get some idea of the scale. This is five meters down. We found a number of interesting things. So this is an ostracon written in Coptic which is an early Christian language uh, in Egypt. And uh, again, in the southwest corner, another room, which you see here, we actually found evidence for the Ptolemaic temple, not much. It's, it's a block, a relief block, which we had to leave in situ, uh, but it's, its location is indicated by the arrow. Uh, and this dates to the Ptolemaic period. So clearly, and it's upside down. So it had clearly been recycled from the earlier uh, Ptolemaic temple when they constructed uh, the Roman one. Uh, here's part of the roof beam. So this roof was stone, part of a statue base. And here's some of the objects that we found. This uh, uh, head, uh, uh, we don't know who this woman is, but uh, the red paint around her eyes survives. There's some gilding, and you can see her hair painted in black. Little head of a gazelle. Uh, these are animals found throughout the desert area nearby the foot. Uh, in marble of, of a classical statuette. Here's the uh, 
inset for an eye for a statue. Could it either be for a stone one or a bronze one? I've pulled uh, this image off the internet so you get an idea of how that would have fit in. And then some other objects, not quite sure what this is. Uh, this little bronze rosette uh, was probably filled with glass paste decoration and then used to decorate a box of some kind. Uh, quickly, some other areas. The area in yellow is a side entrance into the temple. So um, we hope to be working more here this coming season. And then the area in red here is part of the southern perimeter wall uh, of the temple. So we know that the temple went through an initial construction in the Roman period, probably in the reign of Tiberius, and then underwent uh, modifications uh, as the centuries went on. The temple was put together, built with local stone, which wasn't actually very good, and the stones were clamped together using wooden clamps. And very interestingly, our paleobotanical specialist has examined these clamps, and the vast majority are made of teak wood uh, from India. These have probably been recycled from ships that, that came in and needed parts uh, repaired or replaced after they arrived at Berenike from the subcontinent. Uh, certainly, at least the courtyard was revetted in marble. Uh, much of the marble you see here was imported from the Proconesus, which is the Sea of Marmara today in Turkey. It's just south of Istanbul. And to give you an idea of how the revetment would have worked, uh, again, I pulled this from the internet. You can see uh, the walls of buildings, uh, certainly throughout the Greek and Roman world, were often made of brick or lower quality stone. And of course, to give the, the viewer the impression that the whole thing was marble, they would literally uh, paste marble slabs to these walls. Uh, okay, here is again part of the courtyard. This is at the end of, I think, the 2015 season. All of the red arrows, again, point to uh, inscriptions that I've already referred to. I'll just show you a few of them. Again, these are all from the Roman period but written in Greek, so you can see one here with the uh, transcription, and it's dedicated to the goddess Isis, so she was the major deity worshiped in this temple. Here's some more. This one's very interesting because it talks about an aromatics warehouse at Berenike during the reign of Trajan. We don't know exactly where that building is. We haven't located it yet, but this inscription gives us a clue that there is one somewhere on the site. Here are a few others. This man, Marcus Lilios Cosmos, a uh, very important individual. We know his family came from the Bay of Naples area in Italy, and he made these two full dedications on behalf of his crew. He started to make a third one, which was never complete, and he's the individual who made that giant inscription of Tiberius uh, that sat over the uh, entrance to the temple that I showed you uh, a few moments ago. Here are some others. Uh, again, uh, you can see they, these uh, uh, cross a range of dates from the first into the third century. Many of them, of course, uh, are congratulating uh, or thanking the goddess for uh, safe voyages, the safe return of the crews, and of course it goes without mentioning the, the safe uh, return of the precious cargoes coming in from Arabia and India and elsewhere. Uh, here are a few more. Some of these uh, obviously dedicated to interpreters. You can imagine a city like Berenike had a number of multilingual individuals to facilitate trade and to sort of back that up. Uh, we found so far um, examples of 12 different written languages from Europe, Africa, and Asia. Sometimes the Roman emperors in charge uh, were not uh, much loved after their demise uh, and their names were literally scratched out uh, from the dedications. And that's what you see here on the right. Very interestingly, we started finding in the courtyard area uh, pieces of bitumen, a bituminous limestone. Bitumen, of course, is basically a petroleum product. Uh, and this, these, this particular example, we found eight or ten of these fit together to form uh, two inscriptions, one on one side, one on the other, clearly written, as you can see, by different individuals dating sometime to the third century uh, AD. We don't have enough of uh, fragments to, to really understand what's going on with this document. Um, in the inside of the temple itself, uh, we found a number of fallen roof beams. Again, some of them highly decorated. You can see this one here, here, here. It's the same one. That's a 50 centimeter scale. So this would have been the roof, and the area highlighted in red here actually mentions uh, that in hieroglyphs that it's dedicated to Isis of Koptos. Koptos was a city on the Nile, which was the end point of the road leading from Berenike. 
and oh, here you go. So here you can see it here in detail. So the area that you see outlined in red here on this block is what you see here. Uh, then uh, sometimes we still have remains of wall decoration. It's pretty badly damaged and some of the early 19th century visitors uh, noted this and talked about it. Here's some more. And there's an example from one of the publications from 1838 uh, that shows what he saw um, so about a century and a half ago, a little more than that. And then we have some more roof, uh, roofing beams, ceiling blocks, if you will, uh, decorated with stars, uh, with vultures, cartouches of emperors. This one's to Tiberius again. And then sometimes there, after the the construction of the original construction of the temple, people have added subsequent inscriptions or graffiti. Here's one that talks about a man who's added gilding uh, to the temple somewhere, uh, sometime in the period 79 to 81 AD. Uh, sometimes we find blocks that have clearly fallen out of use and been dumped. This is a, a bark stand uh, at the back of the temple. It was found in this room here, the blue arrow points to it. So someone had dug a hole in the floor and thrown this in. This is what it looks like, but the cartouches, again, all date from the reign of Tiberius. So that, that seems to have been uh, when the Roman period temple was constructed, and for whatever reason, uh, this stand was then discarded at some later date. Here's just a small sampling of some of the sculpture. I can't, of course, show you everything, uh, but it ranges from Roman emperors in the guise of uh, Egyptian pharaohs. This is probably the goddess Isis. This is the, um, the uh, god Serapis, who was a secondary deity worshipped in the temple along with Isis. Oftentimes, Serapis' symbol is simply a human footprint, and so you see some dedications here. That's a 20 centimeter scale. This is a 10 centimeter scale. And we found uh, fragments of this broken seated statue, which clearly is of Serapis. And here I uh, use as a comparison, this, this complete statue is not from Berenike, it's from a museum in Liverpool in the UK. And you can see how uh, it's, pretty, it's a pretty canonical style for the representation of the seated god Serapis. Then very interestingly, um, we have these, uh, again, this is from the courtyard area, and when we first found it, we thought it was an example of a Roman wearing a toga. Uh, but an Indologist, in fact, got very excited when he saw these pictures, and he suggested it might be a standing Buddha. And he, for comparison, he suggested looking at this uh, Kushan coin, which is not from Berenike, and you can see the folds and the holding of the drapery in the left hand are very, very similar to the Buddha uh, on this uh, Kushan coin. And then again, I can't show you everything, but some sampling of uh, some of the uh, sculpture in bronze and in stone. As you'll see, we have some wood as well from uh, the temple. Some of them show traditional um, Egyptian deities, others like uh, high, uh, Isis and Horus uh, and Osiris, um, Harpocrates, others um, uh, may or may not be Egyptian. The one on the bottom right could be Isis or maybe Artemis. Uh, and then we come to this room, which we excavated in 2019, not having any idea of what it, uh, what purpose it served uh, in red here. So it's not actually part of the temple. It was built later, we know, probably in the fourth century or later. And we think it might have been a repository for objects cleaned out of the temple at that time. And the room was literally packed with sculpture. Uh, and other materials, as you'll see. I can only show you a, uh, a small quantity of these. A uh, little uh, dancing uh, or acrobat uh, in bronze there. You can see two views of him. That's the remains of a Serapis. This is of a Neptune, Poseidon, god of the sea. And then we found these, which we are very excited about, and I would very much welcome feedback from anybody uh, more knowledgeable uh, than most of us. Uh, on this side uh, of the world. Uh, we found this uh, Steeler plaque, which seems to show three Indian figures. We're not sure uh, who they are. We have some ideas, but we can't be sure. Vishnu perhaps uh, is one, we, we simply don't know. And then we have a head of a Buddha. This is all in local stone, by the way. This is all stone from the Berenike area. And so um, whoever made these and for whomever they made them, they were made at Berenike. Uh, and we probably by people who didn't really know what they were doing, they were probably given sketches or verbal descriptions of 
how to go about carving the representations uh, of these uh, South Asian figures. Very exciting uh, for us uh, was the discovery of two teak busts of the god Serapis. There's uh, evidence that these may have originally been gilded. Uh, remains of a wooden box, this bronze plaque uh, of a winged Serapis that might have once decorated the box. Now, the exciting thing about the, the Serapis images in teak is that, of course, teak uh, came from the subcontinent. We doubt that those figures uh, were carved in India. Uh, we doubt that the wood was brought in specifically to carve the figures. What we now think is that the ships, of course, coming in from India, whether they were Indian made or Mediterranean built with Indian repairs, when they arrived at Berenike after their punishing voyages uh, in the monsoon winds and the winds in the Red Sea, uh, parts would have needed replacement. And these are things like artemons, uh, masts, and so on. And so what we think now is that the Serapis images made of teak were probably recycled from the masts of these ships. We can't prove that, uh, but we've done some calculations and the diameters of the figures uh, would fit with mass sizes of ships uh, ranging from between 20 to 25 meters or 30 to 35 meters. Um, now, we, of course, uh, this is an international port, very eclectic. So again, with the 12 languages and with uh, the religious objects we found, the botanical material um, that tells us some of the eating patterns uh, of the individuals. Um, we have uh, some of the other kingdoms in Africa from the time, other than the uh, Aksumites. And there was a kingdom called Meroe. Uh, which is basically in areas of what are Sudan today. You can see the dates and you can see the general location and you can see how the kingdom of Meroe and Aksum, uh, the sizes waxed and waned over the years. Uh, they certainly had um, contact uh, with Berenike and not just unofficially, but officially as well. We found this uh, fragment of a life-size statue uh, of the Meroitic deity Sebiomecker in front of the temple, tumbled over. So it's, certainly there seems to have been some official presence uh, of uh, Meroitic political power at the site. Here's a bronze statuette from that same little room that I told you about of another Meroitic deity. And then we have a number of these libation tables uh, from all over the site, usually from the late period, from the fourth, fifth, sixth centuries, uh, that also seem to have been inspired uh, by the Meroitic peoples. And then we found this sandstone altar uh, this past season. Uh, this is the altar and these are different sides of it that are decorated in typical Meroitic fashion. Now, as I mentioned earlier, we had a number of 19th century explorers, uh, Italians and British and Americans and others who came here to dig. And so we actually have remains of some of the some of the objects they accidentally left behind during the course of their excavations inside uh, the temple. So we have wine and beer bottles, a sewing kit, uh, porcelain buttons. Here's a bottle with part of the cork still in it, hobnailed boots. Uh, so basically we call it the archaeology of archaeology. So we're examining the finds of our uh, predecessors from uh, 200, 150 years ago who also excavated in, in the temple. Here's some things we just found this past year that are very interesting bearing on this. The remains of a newspaper, the British Daily Mail, and it survives to give us a date of May 4th, 1896, some matches. And we also found this in the same trench, this advertisement for Pears Shaving Soap, which is a company that apparently first started in the UK in the 1700s and still exists today. Um, now, uh, as I said, Berenike was involved, uh, as you all know, with the substantial trade routes by sea also by land. Uh, one of the other powers that, uh, uh, commercial powers that certainly was involved at this time was the uh, desert uh, oasis state of Palmyra, which you see in red here, Berenike in green. The Palmyrenes were certainly present at Berenike. We found a shrine that they dedicated. You can see it uh, marked with the red arrow here. And here's what we found. We excavated this in the mid 90s before we did any uh, of the magnetic surveying. So we basically got lucky with this, these two trenches. 
uh, they were literally a little gold mine full of sculpture and inscription. So we found the remains of this nearly life-size bronze statue of a female. Here's her arm, not sure who she is. And uh, here's part of it too. We found over a hundred wooden bowls with burned offerings. Uh, here's the, again, the statue, some different views. And underneath the statue is an inscription in Greek, um, but it lists uh, a military man, an archer who served in the Palmyrene unit, archer unit in the uh, Roman army. And his name is listed here, Marcus Aurelius Mokimos. And what's very nice about this inscription is it's dedicated to the Roman imperial cult. And uh, we have a precise date of September 8th, 215. AD. So this is the way that would have been arranged. And this whole little shrine was just packed with dedications of various kinds. We found a bilingual inscription in Palmyrene in Greek, uh, dedicated to the Palmyrene god Yarhabol. This is where his bronze statue would have most likely sat. All that survives of that is the hand. The Palmyrenes were involved in um, patrolling the desert on the road between Berenike and the Nile. Uh, we know this because uh, we found, or we didn't find, someone found an inscription dated to 216 AD uh, at the Nile, at Koptos, the other end of the road from Berenike, that also mentions a Palmyrene um, archer unit. Uh, here's some other views of this uh, fantastic but small little building, this multiple cult, uh, not only Palmyrene, but uh, Greco-Roman. We have an Egyptian, as you can see, uh, reclining sphinx recycled into the wall. We found a small head of Harpocrates, an Egyptian deity. Uh, of course, uh, of huge interest is the harbor area. There are two harbors. There's one up here uh, in the northeast and one in the southwest, and we've concentrated most of our attention so far in the southwest. And this seems to have been the major harbor in the Ptolemaic and early Roman period. It was huge. Uh, and we, of course, have only just touched a, a few places in the harbor. Uh, certainly in the Ptolemaic period, uh, turn of the Roman Ptolemaic, there's an industrial area here or nearby. We found these, um, the remains of these crucibles here, down in here, and lots of nails. These huge iron nails are usually used in ship uh, construction or repair. We found a number of these uh, very nice intaglios, stamped intaglios thing from finger rings, as you can see. Here's some more. Uh, jewelry, this particular actually gold and pearl earring was not found in the harbor, it's found elsewhere. But I put it here because this seemed to be the appropriate place for the jewelry part of the talk. And then we found very interesting on the surface, we didn't have to dig here at all in the harbor, we found a lot of this black stone just sitting, as you can see, on the surface. Well, chemical analysis shows that the stone comes from Kana, a port on the Hadramati on the South Arabian coast here, which was an intermediate stop for ships going between uh, Egypt, of course, uh, and the coastal um, Indian Ocean uh, ports of Africa and to India. So clearly a ship coming in uh, from one of these places picked up ballast, which is, of course, stone used to to steady a ship uh, when it's sailing in rough waters. Um, and uh, this one, when they arrived at Berenike, this was discarded here. And if you're not familiar with the term ballast, uh, this is what it looks like. It's used, as I said, in sailing, sailing ships, especially in, in rough seas, so they do not capsize. We found the remains of actual ships from the first and second century AD and ropes used to tie them up. Here are some of the timbers. These are the remains of hulls from first or second century AD uh, ships. They're made of cedar, uh, which is of course a timber available in the Mediterranean. Uh, the closest source uh, to Egypt would have been Lebanon, but it's also available in Morocco and elsewhere. And you can see the ropes quite thick. And when we did surgery on, on these uh, wooden uh, beams, we found that they used a, a typical uh, Roman era construction technique called pin mortise and tenant. Uh, this was very, very standard in the Mediterranean at this time, and uh, people had often wondered uh, what building, shipbuilding traditions they used uh, in the Red Sea and the Indian Ocean uh, in the Roman period. And we know at least some of the ships uh, plying the Red Sea and Indian Ocean uh, in the first and second centuries AD were made using this uh, traditional Mediterranean uh, ship construction technique, which you see here. 
We also found the remains of a, a cedar frame and more rope. This is how the frame would have fit into a hull. So this is the hull planking, which you just saw here. Uh, we also found, you wouldn't think much of these barnacles. Uh, we found hundreds and hundreds of these. And what's very interesting uh, is you can see how they've been pried off these ships uh, as they came in for maintenance. And what's very interesting about these is that, that they, they don't, of course, adhere to uh, ship hulls sheathed with lead, which was typical of what the Roman and the Ptolemies did with their merchant ships. So the fact that these show impressions of timber suggests either that these were not merchant ships, in other words, probably Roman or Ptolemaic military ships, which were not sheathed in lead or copper, or that the merchant ships sailing into Berenike were so heavily laden that the water line came above the level of the protective hull sheathing and the barnacles then adhered uh, to that. But our, our uh, malacologist who studied these tells us this particular species only adheres to ship hulls in open ocean water, not in lagoonal or harbor contexts. Anyway, these ships would show up and of course, as I said, they were battered. They'd have to be uh, replaced, the, the, the damaged or destroyed parts and wood being very, very scarce of course, uh, in the desert would be recycled. So we have plenty of examples of the recycling of ship beams, uh, interestingly made out of both cedar and teak wood. Here's a teak wood beam recycled in one of the walls of the Shrine of the Palmyrenes. You can see the little cut holes here for the mortise and tenon fix up. We also found, and here's some more, uh, we found some iron anchor remains here, as well as pictorial de depictions uh, of the anchors. Um, lots of uh, religious shrines at Berenike, which is again a reflection of the um, of the very eclectic nature of the population, which we saw with the languages and to some extent uh, with some of the food remains. This is the so-called Northern Shrine, uh, and you can see it went through two major phases in the late period here. Uh, here's the earlier phase and the later. The wood here has all been recycled from ships. As you can see here, this is probably part of a plaque, uh, maybe religious in nature, we don't know, but it was recycled as a seat here. And then some other views of this same building in the early period, you see this very long, it's over three meter long teak beam, again with the dowel holes, indicating that it had been recycled from a, a ship hall. And here's some close-ups of that. So this is all part of the northern shrine that dates to the fourth and fifth centuries AD. Uh, some more of the uh, Hadramati graffiti I think we've already talked about a little bit. This one actually lists the name of the Hadramati Palace at the capital city of Shabwa and this particular monogram actually appears not only at Berenike but at another Red Sea port called Mios Hormos and also at the Hadramati uh, Indian Ocean port of Kana. Uh, again, lots of other evidence for the maritime, um, in, the importance of maritime activities at Berenike. You may recognize this, it's a fairly well known uh, graffito of a sailing ship. And then we have nets that may have been used to uh, raise um, or lower cargo off the ships. We have brailing rings made of wood and animal horn. These would have had uh, holes in them. The ropes would have been put through here. These would have tied the brailing rings to the sails, and then they would, of course, raised and lowered the sails through this. Here's some of the lead hull sheathing uh, that I mentioned, and the remains of a cotton sail, uh, actually in a weaving pattern that suggests that it was made in India. So here's how these various things would fit. So here you can see a very good example of one of the brailing rings, and they'd be tied to the sail, so you, of course you could raise and lower them. Uh, here are some of those leather girths that I mentioned to you earlier that we think might have been used for the sails. You see the Serapis bust here recycled possibly from the mast. Uh, and then here you see some other examples over here of the lead sheathing, the brailing rings made of animal horn and wood. And you can see parts of the sail, some of the string. We didn't re restring this. This is as we found it was some of the string that would have actually uh, been used to tie it to the sail. Um, let's take a look. There's a very interesting, uh, after the, the harbor fell out of use as a harbor, uh, sometime after the second century AD, probably as a result of silting, 
uh, they continued to use the harbor, but for other purposes. So we found in the fourth and the fifth centuries this uh, interesting temple, we call it the late Roman Harbor Temple. You can see its general location here. Here are some views of it. We spent several seasons. This is a, a wonderful find uh, because uh, the contents of the temple survive, uh, including some of the botanical remains, some of the osteological remains. Um, it's, it's a, it was a great find and its importance stems from the fact that most temples uh, from the Mediterranean world anyway, even from ancient Egypt, uh, the contents of the temples do not survive. So this is why this is important. Otherwise, it looks fairly innocuous. So here are just some of the finds. Again, I can't talk endlessly about it. In the corner here, the green arrow, we found a little jar, you see it here, filled with some 50 pieces of lunate-shaped silver uh, with little holes in it. I'll discuss that in just a second. Uh, we also found this recycled inscription from 98 AD, some more of the Meroitic temple pools. Uh, we found some cowrie shells, which were used for prognostication purposes, or may have been just a decorative uh, curtain at the entrance of the temple. So here's the jar here that you see in the corner and some of the silver pieces with uh, actually some of the little nails and tacks still stuck in them. We think this might have been uh, either decoration for a wooden box um, or some other uh, wooden decoration, possibly also for the prow of a ship. Um, uh, in in um, uh, Indian uh, Ocean context, especially Arabian dhows, often use uh, uh, decorations like this on the prows of their ships. At the back of the temple, more altars, a patera, which is a bronze, basically cauldron. You can see the remains of the iron tripod legs here. And then uh, again, uh, incense burner. We found a number of ostrich eggshells decorated in red, the red paint. These are magical incantations. A Meroitic temple pool, uh, the, the starogram there, that's a symbol of Isis again. And then some of the sculpture. Again, I can't go into detail, uh, but a range. Here's a little best figurine, an Egyptian deity. Uh, this head very much resembles some from South Arabia. I'll show you in a moment. And we're not sure about this little bronze head, which st stood on the end of a wooden pole. So our, our, little, um, our little head of the bull, the closest uh, parallels we found, are in fact from Southern Arabia. If you look at the eyes and the fur and everything, you can see how closely uh, they resemble these examples, which are not from Berenike, they're from Southern Arabia. Uh, and then Egyptian influences, this uh, may be this, uh, this uh, vesicular basalt thing could be a, an example of a pre-Islamic uh, stone, or it could be an example of an Egyptian dedication. Uh, we're simply not sure. We found the remains of lotus seeds, uh, lotus uh, flowers often used to decorate uh, Egyptian temples and a flower pot. This is what a lotus uh, flower looks like. Uh, and we found a number of, of, of um, tiny uh, sheep bones, uh, which were probably uh, consumed in the temple as, as part of some ritual. Next to the temple, we found this sunken structure. Here's an ortho photo. Uh, we don't know exactly what function this served, but the area was filled. Uh, with uh, architectural blocks, inscriptions, uh, parts uh, of statues, peppercorns, uh, fired bricks, uh, some of the same painted ostrich eggshells that I showed you earlier. The red arrow, which you see here, points to this inscription, which you see here, uh, again, uh, of a Roman emperor whose name was carved out after his demise. And here's some of the statue parts, again, that we found in this same location. Um, the Blemies, uh, I'm sure most of you never even heard of them. Uh, they were uh, uh, a desert tribe um, whose exact origins uh, remain sort of a mystery to us. Uh, but you can see the general uh, area that they probably um, inhabited in their relationship to the Kingdom of Aksum, the Meroes, and of course the Egyptians uh, and the uh, Roman period in Egypt. So they clearly uh, dominated the eastern desert of Egypt. Uh, and the area of Berenike. And we had known this or suspected it for some time. And then in 2019, quite by accident, uh, you see the red uh, circle here in the magnetic map. In this building, the area circled in red, we found this massive inscription. 
about two and a half meters long, written in Greek, uh, but it's late. It's fourth or fifth century AD. And basically what it says, it's a dedication made by an interpreter uh, to a blemmy king named Ismene. Uh, so we're very excited about this. It clearly attests for the first time a uh, official political presence of the Blemies at Berenike. And so again, if you look uh, here, this is the stone. We couldn't move it. It was too fragile. And then this past season, we found some more. The area in blue is this typical Egyptian decoration. The area in red here is yet another inscription uh, that we found in the entrance of this massive building, uh, the forepart of which is decorated with these huge paving stones. So whatever this building was, uh, obviously of great importance. And we continue to excavate here in future seasons. Right next to it, uh, again, very unusual. These buildings originally looked to us like storerooms, but when we dug them, we found a very interesting shrine, a falcon shrine. The falcon was a bird sacred. Uh, to the Egyptian god Horus, and we found an altar, and we found uh, about a dozen remains of falcon birds, and uh, as you see here, some other Egyptian-style dedications, and then we found this very unusual stele. This is again in 2019, Egyptian style with a Greek inscription with a very unusual text. It says, do not boil or cook the head here. And what's interesting is that most of the falcon heads that we found, and the falcon was, of course, sacred to the uh, Greek god Horus, were headless, uh, with the exception of this one, which was actually not found on the altar, but found in a corner here. So are the two connected? That is the falcon remains and the stele. We think so. We also found a bronze harpoon made of iron, sorry, not bronze, but iron, which was a typical symbol of Horus and Isis. In the middle of the intersection of two main streets, uh, our geomagnetic survey suggested a huge four-columned monument. These were fairly typical. It's called the Tetrapylon or a Tetrachionion. You find these fairly regularly in Roman cities uh, throughout the Near East, and we found the remains of two of the giant pillars uh, with this. And then this past season, uh, to great surprise, we found this smaller earlier column here. We now think there was probably a colonnaded street that connected the Isis temple here with this intersection here. So, of course, we want to dig there in the future to find out. Um, let me just show you a few examples of some of the uh, commercial residential buildings since the town basically existed for the purpose of trade. Uh, in the late period, the fourth and fifth century, there was a huge revival of trade through Berenike. And this area of town right in here uh, had multiple storied buildings uh, with the ground floors uh, made up of commercial activities, as we know from a number of archeological finds. Many of them have uh, these niches with shelving, again, made from recycled teak wood. And then the upper floors, which we know were there uh, from the staircases leading up, uh, were for residential purposes. And again, you can see a number of the recycled stones here making up this particular multiple story building. Here's our artist's reconstruction of that. We also, and again, you can see that the common, the common theme here is the staircases leading up to uh, upper stories. We also, I know that sometimes we have the ceiling beams uh, for the ground floor. And these are made of palm uh, trunks. Uh, palm trees are, uh, are indigenous, of course, to Egypt, so that wouldn't have been imported. We have warehouses. Here's one dating from about 400 AD, right at the southeastern corner of the site, still filled with amphoras, which were uh, made in Ilar Aqaba, which is at the northern end of the Red Sea, uh, near the, of course, the, uh, the, Jordan, the Jordanian port of Aqaba, or the Israeli port of Elat, which is right next door. And then we uh, have uh, some something we call Eastern Desert Ware. It's uh, not a, a made on a, on a wheel. It's, it's handmade, burnished. Uh, this may or may not represent uh, the Blemies or some other desert-dwelling tribes. We also have a shirt in an unknown language. You can see that here. That's yet to be deciphered. If anybody has any ideas about that, we'd love to hear them. Uh, church, uh, and then the late period, of course, the Christians are busy on the site, and this building, uh, one of the largest on the site, 
uh, indicated by the arrow, uh, is an ecclesiastical complex on the southern side of which was the actual church, which you see here, and on the northern side of which uh, are cooking facilities, and we haven't completely excavated this yet, we assume also probably uh, re residential areas for the monks or the caretakers of this facility. And how do we know? Well, the layout of the building uh, and also the finds from the interior indicate that you can see a number of lamps here, oil lamps uh, in it with crosses decorating them. That's the handle of a bronze lamp. And this is a lamp with a Coptic uh, inscription on it that says, Jesus, forgive me. Now in the very late period, Berenike uh, falls onto hard times and certainly before the middle of the sixth century AD, that's before 550, uh, the site is abandoned. The very last residents, uh, probably temporary, would come in and build these makeshift walls out of whatever was available. We call them banana walls uh, because they're so shaped. Uh, but these are the very last bits of architecture we find on the site. And as I said, by 550, the site's abandoned. The last literary reverence we have to the site is in 524, 525 AD. What caused Berenike's demise? We're not sure, but probably a combination of factors, silting of the harbor. Uh, we know uh, from uh, um, a court historian named Procopius, who's writing in the sixth century AD that a terrible plague, bubonic plague, plague worked its way up from, the, uh, from probably from somewhere in Indian Ocean, Africa or Southern Arabia, and it worked its way up as these things do uh, through maritime contacts uh, that may have, uh, impacted Berenike negatively. And of course, there's always the possibility of simply they were being outcompeted by Aksumite, South Arabian, and, and Indian middlemen. For whatever the reason, after 550, uh, the site is abandoned. It's never reoccupied. Uh, there is no Islamic activity at the site. As I indicated to you, uh, it was only uh, with Berenike's rediscovery in, in October of 1818 that we knew the precise location of the port. And uh, the only scientific excavations to have taken place at this incredibly important emporium uh, on this uh, early example of a global trade route is our project, which started in 1994 and will hopefully continue uh, for the indefinite future. So thank you very much. I know the talks probably run on a little too long. Uh, but as you can imagine, there's a lot to, to say about the site. Uh, if you're interested in any publications, we've published extensively, and I can certainly pass that information on to any interested parties. So from the USA, uh, under lockdown uh, because of the coronavirus, I hope all of you, wherever you may be, are doing well and staying safe. And uh, anyway, um, have a good day, and I hope you enjoyed what I what I had to tell you about this amazing site. So bye-bye.